Hello, and welcome to Discovery, conversations about the power of arts to connect us to each other and to place. I'm Coven Smith, Senior Director of Arts at the Knight Foundation. For today's conversation, we'll be looking to better understand the challenges of managing social media in arts and cultural organizations. Joining me today are three legends in the arts and culture sector, Jessica Johnson, Lori Bird McDevitt, and Dana Allen Greel. Jessica Johnson is a creative strategist at Snap Inc. Prior to beginning work in the tech industry, she was an award-winning social engagement producer at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Lori is the co-founder of 1909 Digital, a digital marketing agency serving a range of clients with a focus on museums and nonprofits. She is a longtime new social community organizer, thanks to her decades as social decade, excuse me, as social media manager at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. She co-founded and administers the Museum Social Media Managers Facebook group. Dana is vice president of marketing at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Dana has led web and social media efforts at the National Archives, National Gallery of Art, Ogilvy Public Relations, the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and the Kaiser Family Foundation. Dana, Jessica, Lori, welcome to Discovery. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Hi. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Um, so I think we'll we'll start here, and uh, based on our conversation in the green room, this might be the only question we have time to get to today in in the half hour we have. But um, so I'll start just by saying um, there are a lot of misconceptions out there about the work of uh, social media managers, and particularly so in the arts and culture space. So I wonder if we could start with establishing some context around the work itself, and what does the daily work of a social media manager at a cultural institution look like? Um, I, can, I can start us off on this one. Um, I was the social engagement producer for NAMAC for about three years. And in that time, the job entailed every single thing um, that would be coming up with copy for the post. It would be making a graphic if that's what was required. Um, did a few videos also. So from start to finish about each post would take about an hour to three to make, depending on what the project was. But I think the greater thing to say, what does it take to do social media management at an arts and culture space is it takes a lot of talent, a jack of all trades type of uh, person to do the job, but then also a person who's willing to just do the job from start to finish. And then in post-production, you know, customer service, each piece that was done as well. It may be surprising to some, but you know, crisis communications is really a huge part of the museum social media manager's day-to-day -day job. So, you know, of course, it's fun to create content that connects your collection to pop culture. But really, the role of the museum is to document historic and current traumatic events, racism, politics, violence. So, you know, the museum social media manager is really on the front lines of this, so to speak, um, with these topics every day and. They have to respond to the tough questions. They have to be managing the trolls and also things like worrying about um, what controversial object might be hiding in your collection that's gonna pop out at any moment. You really don't know what's gonna happen next. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add working at an environmental organization like the aquarium, we're also dealing with you know the climate crisis and how people feel about that and the politics of that, I think very much um, we have a, a team of social media managers, which I know is incredibly rare in this field. We have about three and a half people. And I think we very much are not just creating content, and that could be imagery. We do a lot of videos. We do a lot of live streaming. It's essentially like hosting live shows multiple times a week. But we also very much think about social media as a community of about three million people that we are responsible for nurturing, um, responding to, caring for them, responding to them. And that takes a whole additional skill set um, in addition to kind of thinking about it as PR or putting content out in the world. It's about responding to the world around you and giving giving people what they need. I wonder if we could talk a little bit more because I, I think, you know, that is a common misunderstanding because I, I, I think you know, many in the arts and culture sector who are, who are aware of this work think of it often as sort of PR, as a sort of, you know, unidirectional um, effort, but that's not really the case, is it? 
Um, so I wonder if you, if you could talk me through sort of maybe what a, a typical day would look like um, or an atypical day if, if, if you're so inclined. I think the typical day starts with waking up and praying that the internet is not on fire. Um, <laughs> to say the very least, I think getting up and making sure that while you were asleep, nothing took off in a negative direction. If something did you know, go viral in a positive direction, that's always a good thing. But um, that and then also um, working at you know the Smithsonian, we have a lot of objects from people who are still living and if if they pass, you know, monitoring the headlines for, for, you know, memorial statements that need to be posted as well. That's, I think that's like the beginning of what my day used to be. It sounds so cryptic to say I started the day hoping that nothing was going wrong. <laughs> um, but to start today, it would be that. And then just easing into the projects, responding to, to emails, and then also concerns from the audience, because you're, you're, you're kind of playing a balance. You have your public audience that you have to be responsive to and accountable to, but then you have your internal museum teams who are relying on you to, you know, support their programming, or um, you need a response from them to to support a piece of material that you're putting out to say, hey, could you fact check this? And I think the the first half of the day is just responding to emails and and customer inquiries. That that would that was how mine worked. What about what about for you guys? I think it's really interesting what you talk about with um, checking for, you know, unfortunately people who have passed away. I, I often get surprised looks when I tell people that I became an expert in writing memoriam posts, um, that that actually was a big part of my job. You know, it's not always about dinosaurs and astronauts, um, you know, so I thought that was interesting you pointed that out. Yes, I used to have like a list of people I would say like, okay, these are the people I definitely need to check for. Um, because, you know, a lot of people, a lot of like, you know, prominent African Americans are getting up there in age, especially, you know, leaders from the civil rights movement. Um, and then like the first wave of like Black Hollywood. Um, so making sure, you know, we're not missing a culture moment there, uh, but also honoring them and, and the work that they did to to even get the museum I was at where we where we are um, in existence. I think that like hyper awareness is a key part of why this job is so stressful is that you need to not only be super aware of everything going on in your institution and what the pressures from within your institution are, but what's happening in the world, what's happening on platforms, what's the mood of the day based on the news. It's just a relent, if you feel exhausted listening to the news as a human not responsible for social media, I think you can multiply that by like 100 because every decision you make about a piece of content to put out or how to respond to something incoming has to be focused on all of those different contexts. And it's really challenging. And if you do it wrong, you get called out in a really public way. And that's very stressful to be really on the front lines of an institution and a spokesperson for an institution and often pretty low on the totem pole in terms of pay in terms of seniority, in terms of trust. Um, so I think that just in terms of understanding what that job is like and why your social media manager may seem really stressed out, I think that's a big part of it. I, I think to put a fine point on it too, um, you know, kind of the day in the life situation, you can have a whole plan, right? Like social media managers want to have a plan so badly. And then because you need to be so hyper aware, you know, you could have a whole media event planned but there could be some other big, you know, um, national or international news that comes out that just makes that, you know, uh, not viable. So that's just another big part of the role. I, to add to that, the last thing, also the platforms, they also decide when they want to crash. And <laughs> that's always the worst. It's always when you're doing a live stream. <laughs> For sure. So there's multiple dimensions of the internet being on fire here that, that, <laughs> that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, in the context of a sort of organizational structure then, you know, how much of this kind of daily stress would you say is, is even understood, maybe much less appreciated for the people you work for? I mean, Dana alluded to the fact that often, I mean, these are, these are roles of tremendous public responsibility, but that are, you know, 
far down in the hierarchy often with probably limited authority. So I wonder if you could talk about sort of the, the sort of internal understanding. And, and actually, Jessica, I, I wonder if, you know, in your transition to, to uh, SNAP, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how maybe that understanding of the value of these roles is, is perceived differently in your space now versus where you were. Okay, yeah, I think that the in the in the cultural institution space, I don't think that how I, I'm, I'm sorry, let's see, let me rephrase this. I'm not sure that all members of the organization understand that running social media for an org is separate from running social media as your individual person. And the things that you do as an individual person are whole, wholly different. Um, than how we approach content from an organizational standpoint. And also with regard to cultural institutions, there are a lot of PhDs. And if you don't have that on the end of your name sometimes, or most of the time in my experience, you're kind of, that's when you get into that, you know, not not as important, but until, until I need you to help me support my program or help me get a post out there. Um, so I think that, the lack of understanding around what it takes to do something for the organization versus for yourself is a is a problem that contributes to why we're treated. And I say we as like I've had this conversation with many of my social media manager friends, um, why we're treated like so I don't want to say unimportant, but just not taken as seriously um, in the organization. And when it comes to, you know, not working at a cultural institution now, everybody's pretty much it feels like everybody's pretty much on the same, you know, playing field because we're not walking around having to call each other Dr. So-and-so or, you know, the role of curator isn't higher than the role of comms person who's, you know, getting the messaging out there and still has to know all of the, the, the things going on behind the scenes. We're not subject matter experts, but we know enough to be some type of expert type of thing. Um, where I'm at an equal, where I am, there's an equal playing field and I feel empowered to do my job that I was hired to do. And I feel heard when I bring ideas to the table. And I think that in my experience in cultural institutions, that's been a challenge because my, I was only good to say like, oh, we got this many likes, right? Or say something that people understood uh, as a general you know, thing, meaning it was good or bad, rather than saying, I think if we talk about this in this way, people will understand it more because to them, it wasn't my job to say how people would understand something because I'm not the expert in this in that field, but I am the expert on the internet, and that's that's my field. And and not having our field taken seriously, it, it can be a challenge. Well, the internet is people too, right? And I think <laughs> this is something I know my team has tried really hard to make visible, and I think we're gaining traction in the social team. It's not just a way to get things out into the world, but they're a really valuable source of information about what the world, what our community, what the people we're trying to reach are thinking and what they do understand, what they don't understand, where they need help making connections. So trying to show that value too, kind of beyond social, what we know from our audience on social can inform policies we make, can inform you know lots of other things that don't just have to do with, with social. I think the other thing I will just say about whether or not people take social media seriously. You know, they see my team doing things like posting fun memes about, you know, cute otters or like playing Animal Crossing on Twitch, you know, playing video games is your job. Sure, and honestly, part of that is for the mental health of my team to bring them joy and to bring the internet joy really helps boost their morale for when they have to deal with, you know, racist responses to things we've put out or, climate deniers or whatever it is, the, those hard parts of the job are balanced out by some of the fun parts, but it's not all the fun stuff. And the other thing that's really invisible is the DMs, right? <laughs> They're by nature private and the social team is dealing with all of that and that's completely not visible to the rest of the organization. So there's a lot kind of below the waterline that people don't understand about the job. Do you feel, Dana, like there is, um, an unwillingness to understand or investigate what's below the waterline on the on the part of administration sometimes. 
No, I think just everyone has their own job that they're responsible for. Like, right, this person's job is to make sure people know about this policy in the legislature and we want people to take action. Cool, but like how are gonna people how are people gonna respond? Are we prepared for the for the an the questions we're gonna need to answer? And yeah. I do think here we've tried to prepare for that around campaigns that we're aware of, right? So we just talked about like the internet and the world does what it's gonna do. Things we can prepare for. We have the subject matter experts sit and write out all the FAQs, all the possible responses, and they're on call for us that day that that news is gonna break to help us with social care. And I think that over time, that does help give those folks involved in that kind of process a sense of like, this isn't just a tweet. This is like a whole day or multiple days of dealing with what, um, what response we get to that news. Well, which takes me back a little bit to um, Lori had earlier mentioned crisis communications, which I feel like is is certainly whenever I talk to people who do this work, it's a commonly understood part of the work, if not maybe the majority of the work some days. Um, but I rarely see it articulated in job postings. Um, and so I, you know, I wonder if, if we could talk a little bit about, you know, is, is there, actually, let me back up. Why don't we just, let, let's talk a little bit more about the, this hard part about the crisis communications themselves. Like, you know, on, on a day where you prayed that the internet would be good and it was not, what, what, is, what does this look like? And, and how can we do a better job of helping others to understood, understand what a, a huge part of the, the job this is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we each have our own stories that we've we've shared about and have, you know, truly caused trauma, I mean, for either ourselves or our team. But um, what's interesting is that it goes it goes as deep as trauma. Right. So there's a popular YouTuber. Um, his name is Dr. Zubin um, Damania, who's called this um, moral injury. So he wants people to stop calling it burnout and start calling it moral injury. Um, and he uses it in the context of healthcare workers. But um, there's a lot to unpack there, but essentially the definition of it is that the work takes a toll on our moral values because we don't have control over how we're handling those scenarios, how we would naturally want to do it. So a nurse has to deal with socioeconomic inequities um, through the insurance industry, for an example. Us in social media, um, we might have a situation where we're limited by a conservative board of directors that are holding us back um, and being tone deaf about social justice issues is just, you know, one example that happens a lot. Um, so crisis and controversies in museums bring all of this to a head. Um, and not only might the museum communications team lack the power to respond effectively, but they're also the ones, as we've talked about, that are on the receiving end of dealing with it. So we're getting it from both sides. We lack power to respond how we naturally would want to. But then we also, you know, are the ones that are, you know, the the face behind the accounts so but i do think there there can be something done not always and not in every institution about that power piece right so making sure that your social media person has a seat at every table where something is being discussed again that's in your control or even in a response um, you know, our crisis comms team very much includes everyone from our social team, even things like how we shut down the aquarium during COVID. We were looking at how other institutions were doing it, what they were saying and what went well, what didn't go well with an audience. And then that informed our press release, not the other way around where a press release went out and then we had to scramble to deal with the social repercussions of that. In that case, our social team had input into how we announced that news. And I think that's really critical and that you build that trust over time. Yep, the, the progress is coming from the social media manager having a seat at that table and being in those conversations. And I personally was lucky to be able to be in those rooms with you know a small group helping with the nuance of language and moments like that. It just, it needs to be everywhere. Sorry, Jessica, what were you gonna say? Oh no, I was just gonna say, I agree. And, um, and bring up that, you know, we're, we're seeing a really large shift from traditional media leading to social media leading. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge change for all communications teams. And one thing that we did at the museum, um, we developed certain processes for particular things. Like, unfortunately, we know people are going to pass away. So we developed a process for our memorial statements. So 
you know, like Dana said, we're not waiting for a press release to come without any information. We'll touch base with the press team to say, hey, this happened. You all have a direction that you're headed. If not, we would go more high level language on social to be, you know, timely and relevant and then follow up, you know, with the full press release when that became available. But it didn't put us at a at a disadvantage um, looking like we were being disrespectful to anybody or, you know, posting very late to then have somebody respond back and say, why so late or things like that. I think the other challenge, and like you said, having a seat at the table, that's not always afforded when those crises that you cannot plan for come out of nowhere. Um, all it takes is one viral tweet to send the internet into a firestorm and you would think museums, it can't get super crazy, but unfortunately it can. Um, I was part of the team last summer when you know George Floyd and all that was happening and we released the talking about race portal, um, there was an instance where someone took a screenshot without context of something that we had on the page on the on the portal and sent it out into you know the Twitterverse. And that was around like 10 in the morning. By two in the afternoon, the president son at the time, the president at the time, son was tweeting about it. And we've gone from now just a viral tweet by a very conservative person to, oh, it's national news and uh, making its way around all corners of the internet, which then really put the social team at a disadvantage because we were not, we were not sure what to do at this point. Um, we're, you know, there's, there's lots of, you know, trolling behavior happening, lots of bot behavior happening, and it's difficult to cipher through all of those things. I think we had like 10,000 replies or things come, like responses coming at us just on Twitter in like a day and a half. There's no way that we could have customer serviced all of that. So what are the stakes when it comes to paying attention to our true audience versus, you know, something that's going awry in a corner of the internet that other people are not even aware of. That was one of our, that's one of the things that we had to balance, but also um, what was being said was very harmful. And I remember thinking, I just wish someone asked me if I was okay at that moment um, or how are you? And actually mean, how are you? Not how are you and getting an update on how many retweets it has now and what's happening. No, how are you? You're reading these, you know, comments. You're we re re started receiving them to our general inboxes um, that were saying some of the most racist things. And here it was, you know, it it was happening, and it was it was affecting me and my life. But not only affecting me and my life and work, but we were working at home, so that was happening in my home. My safe space was no longer safe for me. And we had no response. We had nothing. I can't close the computer and log off because it's technically my job to be there and to be on. Um, and what can we do, not even just as the social media team, because I think social media teams and managers and, and those of us who know each other, we check on each other constantly, um, whether it's through text or we tweet each other. We are always like, hey, girl, how are you? You know, things like that. But I remember just thinking of somebody else from the greater comms team or somebody else in the museum who was aware of the situation and th that they were working on it would just say, like, how is this affecting you? Because we're the only team that had to really truly deal with it. Everyone else was aware and they were making decisions, but they were not in it. And I think that was one of the greatest, that was, I think that's the biggest, you know, crisis challenge ever is to, to gauge how your team is responding, but also what can you do to support your team uh, when we're when we're developing how we as an institution will respond. I'm so I mean, which leads me to to ask, you know, is like like is it is it possible for these not to be burnout jobs? Like I mean, like it, it, is there a way that that you or your team could have handled that situation that did not result in it's now time for us all to to go and do something else. 
you know, like, I mean, is, like, are, are, are we equipped to handle, as a sector, are we equipped to handle this kind of interaction yet? And, and I'm assuming the answer is no. And it, so like what, like, what could we do, if anything? I mean, I have strong feelings about this being the responsibility of museums to fix. Like this is a platform issue. Um, the fact that the platforms are not thinking about where all their free content is coming from and who are the people behind it and putting proper tools in place to protect people from hate speech and all of these other really negative consequences that you're talking about, Jessica. So sure, there are things that museums and nonprofits can do to, to make sure there's a bench. You know, it's not just one person. You know, we talked about seat at the table, but is that person being compensated for filling that seat at the table or are they still being treated like a junior member of the staff? So, yeah, I do think there are things that we can do to make sure people feel supported, checked in on, that they can take a break and someone else can roll on, right? But really, at the end of the day, this is fundamentally an issue with social media in society. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know that we're going to fix that anytime soon. We can we can be advocates for sure, and we can participate in campaigns like Stop Hate for Profit, and lots of there are lots of other campaigns like that that we can put our voice behind. You know, we're not putting tons of advertising dollars into it, so I don't know how much they care when we pull it, but it's a sign. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just want to caution us from thinking that this is our responsibility to fix as a society. I agree. I don't think any I don't think any social media manager in any industry is not going to reach a point of burnout. I do think that you can slow that um, with a number of things. Again, like I said before, just really actually checking on your team to say, hey, are you how are you guys today? Um, and meaning it uh, where, where I work now, Snapchat, we have this amazing thing called council where you can go and they give you prompts and you do like meditation and like there's like an art journaling one that you can go to and they really encourage the sharing of feelings. And again, it's one of those spaces where everyone is set on an equal playing field. So you're not when you're sharing how you're feeling. The question was, you know, posed by someone who's trained to give like to pose questions that are deep thinking, but also open enough to where you can share as little as you want or as much as you want. But I found that in those spaces, people receive it a lot differently than if you were going to talk to your supervisor in their office to say, this is a challenge. It's not complaining because we're all here and we're at an equal playing field and we're just, the questions were posed by somebody in, in an open manner and we're, we're all being vulnerable and open. But it, it because if I go to my boss and I say this is this is really difficult I don't what to do I don't know what to do here a lot of times they're looking for solutions and I'm not even saying there is a solution sometimes it's more so I just need you to understand this is what's happening so that we can we can find what we're gonna what our plan is gonna be what the priority is responding to a certain thing um, and then feeling that support I think when you feel supported by the team the institution you're willing to put up with more uh, than if you were not. And I think no matter how much money you get paid, nothing is going to pay you enough to sacrifice your mental health. And I think that that's one of the other things. So throwing money at a problem sometimes is not the answer. It's actually just empathy and humanity. Um, and if we could remember that, and it's so crazy because as museums, we're always saying, you know, we're, we're pushing that narrative forward about, you know, we're like the, the empathy of things and, and how are you assessing this? And when you go look at an object, what is happening and what are you feeling? But when you are in a meeting with the people that you work with, are you are, are we pushing that same value and, and narrative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you say, Jessica, about having that space to just even reflect and talk, it, that's so important. Um, and I love actually the agile method for project management for this reason. Um, and it's, it seems so foreign because it tends to be in like the tech sector, but a lot of marketing teams are taking it on now and we've adapted it on our team. But what's important about it is this need for um, really protecting your hours or your capacity 
And when something comes up, you move things around. You don't, you don't just add on hours. You have your set hours. So that's a key thing of Agile. But another part is that every week you have a retrospective. This is, I joke that it's um, like therapy time for nerds because it's just like another word other than therapy. But it's basically just reflecting back on the week and the challenges and the weaknesses and, and it, a similar concept to what you were talking about. And it's been so powerful for my team. And I'm really, um, really glad that the museum sector has started to even pick away at talking about this just even a little bit. But I agree with the comments about support from leadership, obviously. And I think that a key part about burnout is that it needs to shift away from employees reactively responding to their needs and finding solutions themselves. And instead, it needs to be leaders proactively finding those solutions to avoid it. Um, that's really the main you know, thing here is shifting to that way of thinking. I say a couple was, things about the idea of retrospective, even if you don't formally do that as part of an agile, you know, sprint type of thing. Um, having that practice of reflection and also showing appreciation, I found in the past year and a half, we've gotten a lot better, I think, out of necessity of being remote, not being together, of trying to like really make a point of spending part of our time in any meeting together, showing appreciation for each other, and especially not in the crisis times and not in just the you know, wow, this thing blew up and it's awesome times, but just that day to day, like appreciation of one another and showing each other support is really critical and can help us think about our process going forward. Sorry, Coben, go ahead. Well, no, the, you answered the question I was going to ask. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so um, we are unfortunately closing in on, on the end of our time together and we could probably do this for several more days, I'm sure. Um, so I'll just ask uh, one last question for for all three of you. You know, sort of given what you you know now um, and and how things have sort of evolved or changed over the last several years. If if you were to give one piece of advice for someone thinking of going into this work, oh look, there's my cat. Um, if you were uh, to give one piece of advice for for someone getting ready to go into this work in a cultural organization right now, um, what? What advice would you give them? And um, Lori, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I mean, I'll just be simple in stating, you know, don't try to take it all on by yourself. I mean, we've said that throughout our time together, but um, at the very least, if you can't find internal support, connect with the new social community on Twitter, on Facebook. We have a Facebook group. There are so many of us that are right here with you and we're all ready to support one another. So um, just know that that exists. I co-sign that, like just even what Jessica was talking about, if you see something happening out in the field and you tell someone like, hey, I see you, I'm with you, you'll get that back. Um, I also think like a great example for our team was my boss, our chief marketing officer follows King Arthur Flower and they, they last year said, we need a break. We're taking a week break. And she brought that idea to our team we decided to take a week-long break and then the field museum reached out to say how did that go so if you see something out in the world that you're inspired by or want to know more about i think this is such an amazing community that wants to help each other out and teach each other so yeah reach out i think uh, my advice would be or is and always will be probably um have a life that is not attached to work there, is, there are so many people, I think, who join the arts and culture space because, I mean, not to say that we're like kind of cool, but we really make it look really cool. Um, <laughs> and so it's really fun and it's really awesome. But I think it's so critical to make sure that your your identity doesn't just get lost in your work, because once you you reach that point of burnout, you you won't what will you have, right? And so also again, to slow that is, is to have a, have a separate identity, have a separate personality from who you are at work. My, my biggest thing is I'm never actually tweeting about museums unless there's like a conversation going on. I, most of the time I post my hobbies, which I do pole dancing as like at my art to reclaim the gaze and really like, you know, stick it to the man, right? But I let people know that like, hey, I'm in museums or I was in museums. If you follow me, you will not see anything about a museum. 
Uh, but I would love to connect with you in in the real world on the outside, right? Um, and that's because we're so much more than our jobs. And I just, if we continue to lean into the things that bring us joy, we'll be able to kind of manage manage our emotions, our anxieties um, that that do happen in the workplace a little bit better. Well, that seems like a wonderful way to leave us here today. Um, so I want to thank all three of you so much um, for, for being here. Uh, Lori, Jessica, Dana, um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, as I said, unfortunately, our time is up. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone. And thanks to our production crew here at night. Um, the uh, beats at the top of our show were created by former night colleague, Chris Barr. And the music that will play us out is composed by the uh, amazing Akron jazz pianist and overall all around fantastic person, Theron Brown. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.